Hinduism has had a major impact on religious beliefs in the Western world over the past half century. So much so, in fact, that Newsweek magazine recently featured an article entitled, We Are All Hindus Now. What do they mean by that assertion? Is there any truth to it? And why do Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism seem to be growing in popularity? For the viewpoint of an expert on Eastern religions, stay tuned. Here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I are delighted to have as our special guest this week a wonderful Christian lady by the name of Carol Matriciana. Carol, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Thank you so much. I love that smile. (laughs) And I appreciate you flying all the way out here from California. Uh, What a flight. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I understand you got fogged in and. Lights had to be changed and all that. But I'm here. You're here, yes. I I don't think the devil wanted us to make these uh, programs, and I think our viewers will understand why when we get into it. I'm excited about getting into it. Well, uh, folks, Carol is a best selling author and filmmaker and is a recognized expert on Eastern religions, contemporary cults, paganism, and the occult. She has been involved in the production of more than 60 documentaries over the past 30 years. Her autobiography, published in 1985, was titled Gods of the New Age. It became an instant bestseller. It was republished in a revised edition in 2008 under the title Out of India. In 2002, she won the National Religious Broadcasters Award of TV Producer of the Year for her video about the Harry Potter novels. Uh, The clever title of the video was Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackaged Making Evil Look Innocent. Some of her more recent video productions have been one in 2007 titled uh, Gods of Inter- Entertainment. It was about the power of the mass media to influence and corrupt the values of society. In 2008, she released a hard-hitting video called Yoga Uncoiled in which she exposed the dangers of yoga and debunked the popular idea that there can be such a thing as Christian yoga. In 2009, She produced another very hard-hitting video entitled Islam Rising in which she clearly demonstrated that Islam is anything but a so-called religion of peace. She is currently putting the final touches on a new video production to be called Wide is the Gate. It is an expose concerning the apostate emergent church movement that is sweeping through evangelical Christianity today. Carol, tell us about uh, how you became an expert on Hinduism. Well, I wish I could take credit for it, but actually I was fifth generation born in India. Wow. So it was my environment, it was my personal experience. Uh, I was born in Calcutta, India. Calcutta is named after the goddess, the black goddess Kali, who has her Mm. tongue sticking out. She has the 29 heads of her husbands who she has slaughtered and killed because she desires blood. So Kali Ghat, the steps of Calcutta, the steps to Kali, was the city that I was born in. And uh, I saw firsthand incredible worship to Kali, the goddess Durga, uh, Shiva. He is the consort who has the serpent wrapped Mm. around his neck, serpent around his arms, serpent around his legs, so that whatever he's thinking, the serpent is thinking it for him, whatever he's doing with the serpent around his arms, uh, wherever he goes with the serpent around his legs. So serpent power is integral in Hinduism. Actually, in all Eastern mysticism, the serpent is raised as a um, being of power, knowledge, and wisdom. Mm. And so I had this, um, as a child growing up, realized the power and the adoration of everyone around me for this sort of so-called white, incredible wisdom. And yet, as a little child, I was I I could feel the spiritual fear somehow. I can't explain it. It was just always um, an ongoing dichotomy. Well, well now, tell us more about your background. Uh, uh, You were born of British parents? I was born of British parents. My father was in the British military and my great-grandfather before him in diplomatic service. Were you brought up in a Christian home? Actually, I was raised a Roman Catholic, uh, fifth-generation Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and a very devout one. Very devout. Because in India, uh, and, and because of my father's devoutness, um, my life was orchestrated by Jesuit priests and by nuns who they uh, advised my father as to which schools I should go to. Um, and so even when I was sent to boarding school later on in my life in England, it was under 
uh, the protection of the nuns, the convent, the Sacred Heart convent that they had decided and put together. So and, and so were you introduced to principles of Hinduism by anyone? Well, you know, uh, interestingly, in every country that Roman Catholicism is, it takes on the culture yes, of the true. country. So in India, uh, uh, Roman Catholicism is actually deeply influenced by Hindu mysticism. So it was a very easy step for me uh, after I left school, um, about 17, 18, being introduced in those days, London, I, I'd just come to London, we, we'd left our parents, my parents had left India, we came to England in the late 60s, where swinging London, the Beatles were in there, the hair, the, the uh, theatre show was absolute number one swinging hit. And um, I remember the promotion of Hinduism and yoga had been completely repackaged for the West. The Hare Krishna devotees were going down the uh, London streets, uh, Oxford Street, in their orange garb, crashing their cymbals, Hari, 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 Rama, Rama, Rama. And I used to remember, I heard this as a child in India, but it was much darker. It was sort of blacker. It hadn't been repackaged for the Western mind, the way that Hinduism came through the Beatles, through Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, through Transcendental Meditation, through the celebrities, so that when the celebrities talked about Eastern meditation, Eastern mysticism, yoga, it came packaged with celebrity status. Mm -hmm. And it was very appealing as we were young people growing up in our 17, 18, 19, 20s, seeing our superstars turning to drugs and Eastern mysticism, of course, we wanted to be involved too. Well, in your book, uh, a wonderful book, which we're going to tell our viewers more about uh, later on, called uh, Out of India. Uh, in this book, one of the things that uh, really stands out is uh, you tell about when you got to London and you were 20 years old, I think this was in 1966, that you went to see a musical and that it was like a life-transforming event, a spiritual event. What was the musical? Yes, it was hair. It was hair. <laughs> and it was transforming. And you thought you had found the truth. Well, yes. And, and really what was incredible about that was that it was the manipulative way that music had now come into that generation. Of course, now it's in this generation who are consumed with music and the powers of music. But music was the conduit to take you into spiritual realms. And without even realizing the spiritual realms that I was being taken into was this polished Hinduism and yoga yes. that I had just come out of. But in <laughs> India, you could see it, it the way, you know, there are hundreds of idols, thousands of idols in the trees, in the monkey god, in the, in the elephant god, in the cow in the middle of the street, which your car is not permitted to move if a cow is in the middle of the street because that is God. Sacred so you cow, can't. Huh? That's yeah, where we got the term? A sacred cow, holy cow. <laughs> you cannot move the cow. The, the, the deity of the street at that moment can hold up your meetings, but you cannot kick that thing out because you can't kick God. But you see, it's not only the cow. Every animal, every living thing is divinity. The trees, the, the rats, there are yes. rat temples. There's a rat temple, yes. Snake temples. So um, the idea of being one with divinity is part of Hinduism. And yet in Roman Catholicism, I, I was raised with the idea that Jesus Christ on the cross was sort of a divinity I couldn't reach because I had to go through Mary and I had to go through prayers and burning candles and had to go through mass and through benediction and my daily devotionals. And so it was a God that wasn't reachable, but in Hinduism, everything is divine. And so the conflict and uh, is huge. I'm going to come back to a point you just made. You, uh, you inferred that the Beatles were very important in packaging Eastern religion to be acceptable in the West. Develop that. Well, the Beatles, of course, were out of England, North England group, young kids played, the, played their band uh, in the garage in the yeah. Liverpool, the Liverpool <laughs> the accent, the, the, the original <laughs> garage band, yes. Discovered um, by Radio Luxembourg, promoted by uh, English titles that then suddenly swept across to America. But they seemed so innocent at first. And then what, what well, happened they, they to were, them? They were sweet little love songs. I think the point is that they got rich very quickly yeah. from, from a garage in Liverpool to suddenly having mm. 
adulation worldwide can go to one's More head. famous than Jesus, John Lennon John said. John Lennon said that. <laughs> that was his quote. And I think what happens is that the, and, and I know from my personal experience, because I very quickly in the swinging 60s rose to being a top model and went from England to America. When you get fame and money so quickly, um, life becomes kind of empty because you have no value mm. on the richness that you've acquired so quickly. And, and then you start looking for spiritual things. But the spirituality that was around in those days was the Eastern mysticism because the, these gurus from the East were flooding yes. into... And they came uh, under their influence. And everybody became under their influence. In, in fact, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi did an incredible marketing ploy. He used the Beatles and all the Hollywood celebrities that were involved and flew them out free to Rishikesh, which is the northern part of India where the goddess flows with all her energies and powers out of Rishikesh to the whole of India. So here you've now got the indoctrination of these celebrities who are trendsetters for the world and they're being filmed all the time so that when they came back to the West, they came indoctrinated. In fact, they, they put out a new album, Sergeant Pepper's Band, I believe it was called, in which they had an album cover where they were standing in front of a grave for the Beatles. It was a symbolic of we are burying the old Beatles yeah. and we're becoming the new ones and we are very much involved in Eastern religion. And every one of their songs, as you got more and more involved in the lyrics of their songs, because they started off as sort of sweet little love well, songs. Yes. Yeah. And then as you got involved in their lyrics, through the transfer formation of lyrics and music, we became Eastern devotees, whether we liked it or not, whether we even understood it. Imagine, I am you, you are me, he is she. These are all words in the songs, which is that God is everywhere, we are all divine. Okay, you start out as a Roman Catholic in uh, India, mainly going through the motions, not having a real personal relationship with God, but doing all the things that you do there. And then you get involved in this new form of uh, Eastern religion religion brought into uh, the West, and you get all caught up in the hippie movement and that sort of thing. Where did you meet the Lord? Well, interesting. <laughs> you see, that was pre-New Age. After, uh, after that, it, this thing got called the New Age, and this New Age spirituality has, not, has crept into the whole of society now. But in those days, because you were on a mystical search, a spiritual search, even if it was for Jesus, it was still called a, a mystical spiritual search. I mean, nobody differentiated between the two because Jesus was one and one and all. And it was actually on a modeling job in Chicago um, that I, through a, another two models that were on the job, it was a wonderful story. I've written it in my book. Yeah. It's a little too complicated to get into in full. But the point was I was taken to the back room. They invited you to a Bible study, right? Well, I didn't know it. If I had, <laughs> If I had known, if I had known it was Bible study, I promise I wouldn't have gone because I did not. I thought Jesus was very narrow-minded because in my new age yeah. uh, embrace of everything, Jesus was too narrow. The Bible was too narrow. Christians were hypocrites and bigots. I was by this time a complete lover of peace into the environment, a vegetarian, a feminist. Um, I, I did yoga. I, 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 I contacted the spirit world. I was gung-ho for the new age. And these friends invited me to um, a party in downtown old Chicago. And uh, I thought there were going to be drugs there. I didn't realize that I had gone into a Christian bookstore because the Lord had so blinded my eyes. <laughs> I was raised in, I, I'd, I'd done graphic design. I was an art student, but my eyes could not see all the graphic <laughs> images because the you'll know, backwards. you'll know when I came out why. But I went into the back room where I thought everybody was passing around drugs because this was such a happy group of people. They were all <laughs> smiling and they were at peace. And I wanted to see where the joint was and there was nothing there. <laughs> but I saw this man, this young bohemian sort of hippie, reading from a well-worn book in the corner. And he was reading and everyone was listening. And slowly I started realizing he was talking about God. That tuned me in that God works in the environment that you're in. That tuned me in. So I came off the idea of looking for where the drugs were passing mm -hmm. and realized something incredible about the authority of this man. I didn't know what it was, but he spoke with an authority. And afterwards they prayed 
and their prayers were very personal. I remember thinking that because I had been raised on the rosary mm -hmm. and um, wrote prayers, sort of uh, repetitive prayers. And this was very free for all praying. And I was so touched by that, I went to him afterwards and I said, you know, thank you very much for, for this. And he said, how long have you been a Christian? Oh. And I said, all my life. Oh, oh you did. That was your answer. That was my still. answer, yeah. all my life. Because, and that's the confusion today. A lot of people who aren't Christians think they are, but I truly believed I was a Christian. So I said, all my life. Here I was doing yoga, <laughs> contacting spirits, involved in spiritism. I, I was involved in every occult, uh, satanic possibility that I could have been involved in in, the, in that era of my life. So he asked one other question which completely changed my life. When did you accept Jesus Christ into your life? Wow. I'd, I'd never been asked that question. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know that. And I think he felt me stumbling yeah. and he came in right there with a 12-minute gospel, which was the power of God unto salvation. 12 minutes. He had me riveted. I was focused. I realized that there was somebody that died for me, that loved me so much wow. that he died for me. I had, no, I had a lot of boyfriends by that time. <laughs> Model, <laughs> All of, of course. them told yeah. me that they yeah. loved me, but none of them would have died for me, I promise you. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and just to know that somebody died for me, it totally changed wow. my life. And he Love said, would you, would you like to um, accept Jesus Christ into your life right now? Of course. I mean, how could you deny inviting somebody that loves you so much that he gave his life for you? And at that moment, it was almost like a vacuum cleaner came into my life. Every one of my transgressions was wiped away. I was slated clean. I walked out of that little room at the back and the room that was in the front was a Christian bookstore with hundreds of books all about Your Jesus. Your eyes were open now, you could see that. Yeah. I thought, how did I get in here not realizing? Spiritually blind. Huh? It was incredible. Yeah. What a story. Well, we're going to take a break for just a moment and we'll come back and talk about the impact of Hinduism on the West. Welcome back to our interview of Carol Matriciano. We have been talking about her a journey from Hinduism to paganism to Christianity. Carol, I want to thank you for the testimony you just shared with us. Man, I was tingling all over and wanted to stand up and shout hallelujah and everything else. It's, it was great. It's one thing to read about in your book, it's another thing to hear you tell about it. Going into a place looking for drugs and coming out with Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, that, that is really something. Uh, I tell you what, I, I would like for you to just tell our viewers how they can get in touch with you, get on your newsletter mailing list. So, would you just look in that camera and tell them? Well, thank you so much. Yes, actually you can just go to my name. It's spelled differently, C-A-R-Y-L. So, it's www. C-A-R-Y-L-T-V.com, CarylTV.com. And uh, you can subscribe. We have a free newsletter that comes out very regularly on contemporary issues, how the New Age movement and uh, all the new nuances and the new spirituality are coming into our churches and into Christianity. And um, thank you. And okay, the, you know, Carol. And all the movies. All right. you, get, you get a our ten minute trailer and uh, well, you have a preview of all the movies that we've okay. made. Okay. Now Carol, uh, I want to uh, talk with you for just a moment about the impact of Hinduism on the uh, Western uh, world and also on Christianity. And I'd like to do it by quoting to you from a Newspaper Week magazine article that I just thought was phenomenal. The article was entitled, We Are All Hindus Now. And it said, America is not a Christian nation. We are, it is true, a nation founded by Christians. And according to a 2008 survey, 76% of Americans continue to identify themselves as Christian. But according to a 2008 Pew Forum survey, 65% of Americans believe that many religions lead to eternal life including 37% of white evangelicals, the group that's most likely to believe that salvation is by Jesus only. Also, the number of people who seek spiritual truth outside the church is growing. The 30% of Americans call themselves spiritual and not religious, according to a 2009 Newsweek poll. And that's up 24% since 2005. Stephen Prothrow, a religion professor at Boston University, has long framed the American propensity for the divine Delhi cafeteria religion as very much in the spirit of Hinduism. 
Mm -hmm. Well, as I, I told you earlier, I thought myself a Christian. And yet here I was involved in all of these new age, new spirituality, pagan, occult, Hindu, Eastern mystical uh, practices, and yet truly, truly believed I was a Christian. So I can see where a huge percentage of people would answer that kind of a survey saying, yes, I'm a Christian. But do they actually understand biblical Christianity? That's Most are difference. probably what you would call cultural Christians, just born into a Christian society, go to church, but no, never really know the Lord. No, and that's, that's the danger because we're all born with a vacuum inside yes. of us to know God. And if society, through the celebrities, through our movie stars who are turning towards Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, even our, our Christians from the pulpit that are, uh, are speculating, not even speculating, recently Rick Warren was right on there inviting his three expert guests who are all involved in Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, transcendental meditation to come onto the screen. And so if you've got a pastor like Rick telling the people to um, follow their health and well-being program and you think here's a Christian telling me to do things, you don't realize that all of this is becoming confused and enmeshed in our Christian culture, in our Christian churches that are embracing Eastern mystical ideas. How do we identify that then? I mean, you, you grow up in Hinduism, you've lived through Hinduism in an American type and British setting, but for the rest of us who, who believe that we're in a Christian nation or even maybe a post-Christian nation, how can we identify that Hinduism has reached into the United States and where is or it into even our church? That's yeah. a great question and you know there's only one way. That is to really know your Bible. Hmm. See, it was the first time that evening when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ that I went on a crash course because they told me, have you got a Bible? I said, no, Bible. I, a Christian all <laughs> my life. That, right? I didn't know I needed a Bible. <laughs> I read the Bible from cover to cover in those six weeks five times. Wow. Because that I had a, a hunger. When you give your life to something, you really give your life. Uh, <laughs> you suddenly realize you've been missing the bread of life, the water of life, the food of life. Filling and, that and you just, it, desire, it suddenly right? filled it up. So I think the way that you can really tell a transformed Christian is if they have a love of the word, a love of the truth, and then they're filled with the Holy Spirit that then applies that truth to, in answer to your question, to be able to discern what is evil and what is good. Because you can work out from that survey, for instance, it talked about that, uh, that many Christians believe that there are many paths to eternal life. Not true. Mm -hmm. If you know the Bible, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You get abundant life through me. I introduce you to the Father. You can only come to the Father But you see, our major me. value today, Carol, in American society seems to be tolerance. And that is so intolerant to say Jesus is the only way. Yes, because that's part of Hinduism. You see, Hinduism is all embracing. Yes. It's, it believes that all paths lead to God, that you can have your truth, you can have your truth, we can all have our truth, and let's have unity. And you can have the elephant God, and I can have the rat God. And yes. Why is that? I mean, what is their view of God then? Well, God is a consciousness. And it's a consciousness that you have to connect to mystically. That's what yoga was designed for. Yoga is the only path into changing your mind, your consciousness, to go within yourself to arouse the snake, which is believed to be inside of you, and then connect to God consciousness, which is a force. And then you realize your divinity. In, in Eastern mysticism, there is no such thing as sin. It's your ignorance that you are divine. So yoga and every mystical practice is to connect you with your divinity, which will then connect you with the whole embracing universe. Reminds me of Shirley MacLaine in her uh, uh, books talking about, if you really want to find God, you must go inward. You must go like inward. But we have the answers? Well, I, and look what the Bible says. <laughs> Jeremiah 17 yeah. says there's no good thing within us. Jesus no. says that what comes out of our mouth is what defiles us. Yes. So to go in, which is what I had been doing through Eastern mysticism, you get confused, you get lost, you... you start living subjectively. Volitional processes take over. Emotions become your truth. Well, I feel that's truthful. I feel that's truthful. But when I got redirected back to the Bible, I could then go to my objective truth and say, well, what does God say about that? 
Is that, it, can I have eternal life? Do all paths lead to God? Are we all divine? Can we all become one with everything? So it has to be the Bible that becomes our yardstick. And I tragically believe that hundreds of thousands of Christians in America go to church on Sundays but do not read the Bible. Mm -hmm. They have maybe a little Bible verse thrown up on a, a screen, multiple screens up there on PowerPoints and stuff like that, but they do not go and check what they're being taught against the Bible. In Acts, Paul said that the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they searched the Scriptures daily and checked them against what How much taught. more should they check you and me? Uh, they should check me 100%. <laughs> what are some other things about Hinduism that you could just definitely point out so we can say, hey, you know, let's stay away from that? I think anything that makes you rely on your emotions and your feelings and well, your that's experiences. Very postmodern emergent church. Isn't that it? is. You see, okay. the, 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 the whole belief is that nothing is, uh, truth is not absolute, that we can oh, yes. all find our own truth. Mm. And so when you have that coming into postmodern thinking, into the seminaries, into Christians that are being trained to be pastors, then they go out onto the pulpit and say, um, well, whatever you all believe is okay. I want to be politically correct. I don't want to offend anybody. You're not all sinners, which of course is what Hinduism teaches, but that isn't what the Bible teaches. So if your pastor comes in and says, uh, we're going to have a lesson this morning on uh, what uh, uh, homosexuality, for example, and instead of saying what the Bible says, says, how do you feel about this? Let's, let's talk about how you feel about it. You're really off on the wrong track. You're off. You're and it's, well, in Hinduism, homosexuality is embraced. In fact, homosexuality is part of religianity or mysticism. Or Carol, I'm sorry to say our time is up. I wish we could keep going on and on, but we're going to have to bring this to a close. Would you be willing to come back next week and talk with us about, quote, Christian yoga. I'd love to. Thank you. Well, very, we very would much love to have you do it. I know you're a real expert on it, so thank you, and uh, we look forward to having you back. Well, folks. The book Out of India is a true story of the New Age movement. Carol Matriciana was born and raised as devout Catholic in India, where she was surrounded by Hinduism with its mysticism, yoga practices, belief in reincarnation, and the divinity of all. She writes about her confusing childhood experiences, witnessing India's caste system and animal worship. As a young adult now living in the West, she began became involved in the hippie movement of the 60s, where she unwittingly embraced Hinduism as it was repackaged and called the New Age. She tells the captivating story of her personal spiritual struggle through a maze of contradictory beliefs until she finds truth and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Out of India traces the roots of the New Age emerging spirituality, which is shaping business, medicine, education, and government. Sadly, it is also seducing millions of Christians away from the truth of biblical Christianity. To get your copy of Out of India for a gift of $15, plus shipping, go to lamblion.com or call the number you see on the screen. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Once again, this week, my colleague Nathan Jones and I are delighted to have as our special guest one of Christendom's foremost experts on Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Our guest is Carol Matriciana, a writer and video producer from California. Carol, welcome back to Christ in Thank Prophecy. Thank you very much for we having me. We are delighted to have you. And I tell you, Carol, that program we did last week was a real blockbuster. I still feel uh, tingling all over from your testimony about how you went to a place looking for drugs and found Jesus Christ. Incredible story. <laughs> uh, in fact, well, Nathan, how about kicking off our discussion today? Sure. We're talking about yoga, and you're an expert. Can you tell us why you're an expert on yoga? Well, Nathan, I was actually born and raised in India for the first 20 years of my life, so I saw the practice of yoga. I wasn't involved in it because I realized it was Hinduism. I mean, in, in fact, in, in Hindu teaching, it is known that there is no yoga without Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga. Interesting. The two cannot be separated. It cannot be separated into spiritual exercise because the very point of yoga, which was designed in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu writings, the Hindu holy scriptures, they call it, the Bhagavad Gita, the actual God, the deity in there designed yoga for the individual to connect to his God consciousness. In Hinduism, they don't believe that you're a sinner. They believe that you're ignorant of your divinity. So the spark within you has to be ignited through yoga discipline. And um, in, in fact, another interesting thing is that it's believed that there is a lying, a coiled serpent asleep in each person waiting to be awakened through yoga disciplines. The 
serpent is known as wisdom, power, knowledge, and if that is brought up through the chakras, which are energy psychic centers, they call them, it's, a, it's metaphysics, it's not true, it's not scientific, uh, certainly not biblical, but the snake is brought up through self-hypnosis, through going within oneself, through breathing, through waking it up, through uh, disciplines, repetitive saying the names of the deities again and again through repetitive things called mantras, repetitive prayer, through breathing, pushing it up till eventually it comes to the third eye, the sixth chakra, and then comes into the mind, into consciousness where you realize that you're divinity and you your connect divinity. that you are divinity huh. because within Hinduism, it's understood that divinity is in everything. God is in everything. Everything is divine, whether it's the rat on the street, the cow in the street, the monkeys in the trees, you. In fact, in, before every yoga class, you say namaste. That means in Hindi, the God within me bows to the God within you. So that is all an integral part of the spiritual discipline of yoga. And Brahman is understood to be a God consciousness, not a person. So when you say that you become God, in the Western world we see God, the God of the Bible, the Creator God, is a person and Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons in one, the triune God. That is not the case in Hinduism. In Hinduism it's a consciousness, it's a force, it's a thinking that you need to connect into. So in fact you need to alter your worldview. Did you ever become a practitioner of yoga? Yes, I so did. So you have experienced it firsthand, not just observing it. No, as I grew up in India, I observed it being practiced. But uh, in when I was about 19, 20, my parents returned mm -hmm. to England. I got involved in the New Age, which I didn't realize was a religious uh, mechanism to change our worldview into an Eastern mm -hmm. mystical worldview. So the New Age that I saw in the West was a completely polished cleaned up, appealing, manipulative enticement into a different worldview. Did the yoga work in the, in the sense that it really can bring you into an altered state of consciousness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is a powerful spiritual What's practice. wrong with going into an altered state of consciousness? Well, you, first of all, you give up your mind, yes. but you don't realize you're giving up your mind. <laughs> and the first commandment says that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our mind. We're not allowed to put our mind into neutral mm -hmm. within, biblical, um, within the biblical mandate. In fact, uh, David talks about that I meditate on your law day and night. The Lord tells us to bind his law on our heads. So it's a mental rumination of meditating on the word which is quite different in the practice of yoga where you meditate on an experience mm -hmm. so you you go into yourself and you imagine and you have subjective emotions about what you feel and it's very very powerful wouldn't this open you up to demon possession or at least demonic attack well I didn't know at the time, because I wasn't a Bible-believing Christian, that what I was getting involved in was opening doorways into the occult, opening doorways into demons. And is that I what that snake is? Is that a demonic spirit? Well, the snake is the master of all demonic spirits. It was the snake in Ezekiel and Isaiah and the stories we're told there where he says, I will be like the Most High. He acknowledges that there is a Most High. So the serpent, the Lucifer, the snake, okay. knows there is a monotheistic God. But I will be like the Most High is that he introduces polytheism. Many gods, the idea that we can all be like gods. And why not? Because we're in the Bible, we're told that we're children of God, but, and we're also told that we're created in His image, but we're not children of God until we come through Jesus Christ, through repentance. So what this is, is it's a counterfeit way through, of experiencing, uh, uh, through creative manipulation, which is what Satan did. He was a liar. He said, I will be like the Most High. He created in his imagination a reality that doesn't exist. He cannot be the Most High. Now, Carol, a few years ago, uh, you went back to India and you produced uh, a major documentary on yoga called Yoga Uncoiled. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, tell us about your experience there in India. Well, the reason I went was because 
Christians today are practicing yoga and it's being called Christianized yoga. Mm -hmm. it, it can't, there, there is no such thing. It's like saying Christianized Hinduism. It's like saying Christianized occultism. Yeah, well, I want to get into that in a moment. I want you to tell us right now, what did you do in India? Well, I went to interview yogis. Okay. Th those are the practitioners of yoga to say, can the spiritual discipline, the spiritual connections of yoga be separated from the physical exercises because okay. in America, everybody's saying that they're just involved in yoga, which they called flexing and stretching. And were, were they willing to be interviewed? Oh, yes. Oh, in, mm. the movie, in the movie you see in Yoga Uncoiled, okay. I interview not only the yogas, yogis in India, those are the yoga teachers in India, and actually film classes going on and people that can explain what yoga means in India, but I also also then interviewed a Christian who teaches yoga. She's a pastor wow. in her church. Okay, this is fascinating. Yoga. I tell you what I want to do. I want to pause right now and show a clip from that uh, documentary called Yoga Uncoiled. Today in the West, about 35 million Americans are into yoga, just seeing yoga as a physical fitness. Yoga is a Hindu word. Yoga is a Hindu discipline to become one with the universal consciousness, which means become one with God, which God? Brahma, the Hindu God. There are many various paths to yoga. Uh, in the sacred text of Hinduism called Bhagavad Gita indicates uh, three different paths. First of all, Bhakti Veda is a focus on a deity. Then Jnana Yoga is a focus on wisdom. Then the karma yoga is uh, based on your good deeds and actions. You have a number of yogas. Yoga is not one entity, but it has a wide variety of yogas. Uh, so the, each yoga has the physical aspect and the spiritual aspect. The physical aspect is controlling the physical body. They control the breathing, they control the uh, mind, thinking activity, they control the physical movements, and so uh, and the timely behavior to discipline the body in the morning, night, how to uh, control the bowel movement. These are all the forms of the physical part of the yoga. If you're practicing yarn yoga, or should I say a raja yoga, the primary focus of that te technique is to bring the mind into perfect stillness and to focus the mind in a very deliberate way on a particular uh, sound or vibration or image as it may be in the Tibetan Mahayana tradition of Buddhism that brings the, the mind into a state of quiescence, peace, such that revelation can occur, experiential penetration of a higher truth or another truth. So it's a way of manipulating the mind to generate different uh, experiences or insights or cognitions that are supposed to be connected to the apprehension, experiential apprehension of higher realities. According to Hinduism, the highest reality is to become aware of one's own divinity. Hinduism respects everything as deity. The cows on the street, the monkeys in the city, the idols which are half men, half animal like creatures. But the highest goal is realization of one's personal divinity or God consciousness. This realization can be experienced through direct perception deep within one's own mind a place known as the seat of concentrated wisdom, an area between the eyebrows which is known as the third eye. It is also called the sixth chakra, meaning wheel, and recognized as psychic energy. The other chakras are said to run along the spine starting at the bottom, blossoming at the top, meeting at the agna, meaning command. Here at the agna, the third eye is the central point where all experience is gathered in total concentration and is also believed to be the base of all creation itself. In this hotel where I was staying, each morning the local priest would come to offer the morning puja or prayer rituals to the gods. He'd prepare arti, the celebration of light through fire and mix the vermilion red mixture for bindi or kumkum, the dot seen between the eyebrows. This bindi or kumkum is believed to retain psychic energy in the human body and control the various levels of concentration. Here, the hotel manager explains 
that the bindi or kumkum and arthi fire are being prepared not only for the gods but also the hotel guests who are esteemed as gods. For our gods, we place this kumkum as a tradition. Okay? The guests are a god. The guests who's coming in here are our gods. Okay? So we keep the bindi, we do the arthi and the bindi for the guests. They are like our gods. Uh, in Hinduism, they have more than 330 million gods. That means everything is God. Whatever you see, whatever you touch is God. And uh, the sun God, the moon God, and all, uh, all, everything is God. So man and nature, man and animal are one. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and our interview with Carol Matriciani, the producer of the video Yoga Uncoiled. Carol, uh, I want to get into our discussion in this segment by reading you a statement that was made recently by Albert Moeller, who is the president of uh, Southern Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he spoke out against uh, the practice of yoga, and he generated a storm of controversy. Uh, as you yeah, know, this I is very imagine. controversial. <laughs> and he said this, quote, the idea that the body is a vehicle for reaching consciousness with the divine is not Christianity. Christians who practice yoga must either deny the reality of what yoga represents or fail to see the contradictions between their Christian commitments and their embrace of yoga. What is your response? Well, their embrace of Eastern mysticism. That's exactly what it is because yoga was specifically designed for a purpose within Eastern mysticism. One, to awaken the idea that we are divine and that divinity is within us and we are one with everything. The second is to shorten our reincarnation cycle, to prepare us for our reincarnation cycle. That's the purpose cycle. of yoga. The purpose <laughs> of yoga is to teach you how to die in order that you can come back in your next life as a better person. It's suicide? So, it's suicide. <laughs> yoga is suicide. It is, an, it is a discipline to prepare you for death in the, within the context hmm. of Hinduism, which believes that your spirit, that you don't die, that you come back again and again and again. In fact, Gandhi said that reincarnation is a hopeless cycle of imprisonment. The Hindu knows they cannot get out of reincarnation, that they're going to be born again, die again, born again, die again. So why, my question would be to a Bible-believing Christian that understands that Jesus Christ died because we were separated from him through our sins, he died in order to give us reconciliation with life for eternity, we've got reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Why practice a discipline designed for death? So basically what you're saying is that the term Christian yoga is an oxymoron. Well, like a lot of things in the new emerging <laughs> Christianity, that's exactly what it is. It's Christianized occultism, Christianized Hinduism. Uh, in fact, in my movie, Yoga Uncoiled, the Hindus uh, are very angry with Christians that try and steal their religion and Christianize it. Mm -hmm. And yet Christians will say, well, I can separate it. I can actually do, uh, uh, I, I only do the spiritual exercises. But let's question that. I, I play tennis. I don't play Christian tennis. <laughs> I, 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 we do yeah. exercises for our body and we can do gymnastics and flex and stretch. Yeah. That, that's called gymnastics. The moment you call it yoga, yoga means to yoke, to unite with God consciousness. Many of the positions used within yoga are the names of the deities. Those positions are called asanas. And those positions are a deity that you become and you merge with within an Eastern worldview. So if they want to do stretching and flexing, which I do every time before I play tennis, I think about the muscle I'm pulling, I think about the muscle I'm stretching, I think about the position I'm going in order to you know, do the appropriate stretching. I don't think of a cobra, which is one of the positions in yoga. <laughs> is that cobra. that three, third finger thing where they sit like that? You know that, what? Or? You shouldn't do a mudra like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me why. Why shouldn't I do that? Because that is believed to be part of the prayer. 
that you pull in the vibrations, you hold your hand in a particular way and you say that word Om, which is a vibration of a God. Because wow, everything is God consciousness, our positions, our repetitive prayers, which are called mantras, you say the name of the deity and they believe that the vibrations saying Om connects you to the vibration that began the world. You see, the basis of yoga is evolution. And evolution is the faith of Hinduism, that everything is becoming better. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you understand that nothing is getting better. We're on a decline, we're getting worse. Yes. They're two opposing worldviews. Yoga is designed to make you feel better, because they believe it's encouraging the divinity within you to realize that you're God consciousness. Actually, you're getting involved in a lie. It's deception. Why not? just do good physical exercises and Paul said that it profit our body a little bit to do a little bit of spiritual a uh, little bit of physical discipline that's fine but then why don't we meditate on incredible things that God has done for us mm -hmm. which is what it's all about on the promises of God and not put your mind into a vacuum oh. into an experience of wanting to make yourself feel better so that you can come into the presence of God. Now, when I was a Roman Catholic, we practiced the presence of God. That is, when you go into a Roman Catholic church and the red light is burning on the altar, that is to tell you that the Eucharist, the piece of bread there, has been made into the actual body of Jesus Christ. And so when you come into the church and make the sign of the cross, you are practicing the presence. You are walking in a mystical worldview with your mind and reason telling you that that piece of bread is actually Jesus that is going to be crucified or die again uh, during Mass or has been left over from Mass and is up there. So in a mystical way, I feel the presence of Jesus. When I became a Bible-believing Christian, I had to toss that out. I had to repent of those feelings and now rely on the promise which says that Jesus will never leave me. It is a completely different walk of faith versus experience, experiencing through subjectivity. Now, I may not feel like I'm in the presence of Jesus when I walk by faith, but Jesus said he would never leave me. He will never leave me alone. He's my comforter. He's the lifter of my head. He's my bulwark. He's my sustainer. He's my sufficiency. Those are the promises I have to depend on in faith. Well, Christian meditation never consists of emptying your mind to become a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would be meditating on Scripture, reading mm -hmm. Scripture and thinking mm -hmm. about Scripture. And the character of God. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. David said that quite a lot. Meditate on God's Word day and night, but not the meditation that yoga is teaching, right? Well, no, it's a meditation on the character of God. How good you've been to me, God. How merciful you are to me. Thank you for dying to give me eternal life. Thank you. I'm a worm. I've been separated to, from you by sin. Whereas in Hinduism, you're not considered a worm. You're considered divinity, divine. You've got to awaken it. And you mustn't have a low self-esteem of yourself within Hinduism and Eastern mysticism. You just have to go to India to see this doesn't work. In India, there is huge poverty, huge... Mass starvation. Depression. If yoga worked in India, these people would be elated. <laughs> They're not. That's right. Welcome back to our interview of Carol Matriciana. We've been talking about the danger of any Christian practicing the Hindu technique of yoga. Carol, let's uh, close up our show. Uh, could you show us the significant differences between Christianity and Eastern religions? Well, in Eastern mysticism, there's no such thing as sin. It's your ignorance that you are divine. See, in biblical Christianity, the whole concept of having a relationship with Jesus Christ is based on me being a sinner. But God loved me so much, he didn't want me separated from him for all eternity. He sent his only begotten son so that through him, my sins might be forgiven and I can be reconciled back to him. In Hinduism, the only recognition reconciliation, if you will, is because they see death as a hopeless cycle of imprisonment. So the only reconciliation is for you to come back better the next time round through the practice and discipline of yoga. So you can somehow be a better sinner. I, I hate to say it like that, but within <laughs> biblical Christianity, we believe that you're a sin is a sin. You're a sinner. In Hinduism, 
they think you can be a better person. With the, what, the guru being the, the most holy or the most sinless of their group? Not really. The guru is a God-man. The guru has, has connected with his enlightenment that he is God, and he wants all his devotees to connect to their divinity and realize that they're God, because that way they can then control their death, their destiny. Well, there's no such thing. We can't control our, desti our destiny. But you see, we have to come back to the serpent, who is the initiator of Hinduism. The serpent told Eve, surely you won't die. The Hindu's idea of reincarnation is surely you won't die. So right. it's the procrastination of death that I can come back better in my next life, in my, in my next life. So I think that is a huge difference. There in Eastern mysticism, you're connecting to a God force. With us, through biblical Christianity, we connect, we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, which is a personal relationship, a person. Hinduism doesn't believe that, um, there's, that there's any such person out there. It's a universal God in everything, everything is divine concept. Pull you up by your own bootstraps and save yourself, basically. Yes, Whereas yes. in Christianity, we need a savior to save us because we can. Uh, that, and that's the primary difference. Okay. And, and, that, and that death has been conquered for us. In Hinduism, it, it hasn't been. It's ongoing. It's reincarnation. And I think another thing, when Christians get involved, they say, oh, I've heard lots of people say to me, well, I only did it once and then I didn't feel right. The reason they didn't feel right is because they opened themselves up to demonic spirits. That mm -hmm. must be confessed. In order for a Christian to have a life relationship of fellowship back with the Lord, go to 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we confess our sin, then he who is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Go to the Lord, say, Lord, I've sinned. I got involved in something that I was ignorantly involved in. I didn't realize I was opening myself up to demonic spirits. I confess my sin. Lord Jesus, at that point, you're forgiven, you're back in fellowship. But um, if you allow that, those demons to come in within Hinduism, uh, those demons become our familiar spirits. They're familiar. We, we, as Christians, we say, well, I didn't really sin. I didn't really do that bad. That's a familiar. You either sinned or you didn't. You're either <laughs> pregnant or you're not. You know, yeah. it's like, that's yeah. it. So... We have to come back to the fact that to realize I'm a sinner, yes, I tangled with the occult world. It's like, well, I kind of sort of played with Ouija boards, but I didn't really <laughs> sort do of it. Kind of played you know, no, you, you, you became involved in a vehicle that takes you into mm -hmm. a demonic world where they want to possess you. So you have to come out as a Christian, whether you've practiced it once or for years and years and years, it doesn't matter. It's in, according to the Bible, we have to call evil, evil. Well, Carol, evil. I hate to say it, but our time is almost up. And I want people to uh, find out more about uh, your ministry. And uh, I know one way they can do that is to get on your newsletter or mailing list where you discuss all these issues. It's free of charge. How about mm -hmm. telling our viewers how they can do that? Well, they can go onto my webpage, www.caril. My name is spelt a little differently, C-A-R-Y-L-T-V.com, seven letters, C-A-R-Y-L-T-V.com. And uh, there they can preview um, many of the 60 movies that we Great. produced and get the book. Well, thank you, Carol. And I tell you, it, it's been so exciting to uh, talk with you that we're going to invite you back for a third week oh, okay. and kind of shift things a little bit. We're going to talk about the impact of Eastern religion upon Christianity in America, particularly in the apostate emergent church movement, which has been heavily impacted by Hindu type thinking. And I know you're making a major video production on that right now, which is called what? The Wide is the Gate. Wide is the Gate. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have you come back next week to discuss that with us. And uh, we look forward to that. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I'm sure it has. And I hope you'll be back with us next week when Carol Matriciano will discuss the dangers of the emergent church movement. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you enjoyed today's program, you will like the video, Yoga Uncoiled, a revealing look at the growth of yoga throughout the Western world. Video journalist Carol Matriciana, who was born and raised in India, returns to her native land to search for truth among India's leading experts and examines what Christian yoga practitioners in the West are saying about their yoga participation. 
Once viewed by Christians as a pagan import from the East, yoga has now become mainstream in the church and is advertised to improve spirituality and experience God's presence. But is yoga's mysticism compatible with historic Christianity? With critical discernment, this hard-hitting and informative DVD explores the ramifications of dismissing yoga's core spirituality and blending biblical terminology and precepts with Eastern meditative techniques and practices. The Bible prophesies that in the end times Christianity will come under increasing persecution. That prophecy is being fulfilled today. All across the world millions of Christians are being verbally abused, physically harassed, and yes, even murdered for their faith. But these attacks, as terrible as they may be, are not the greatest threat to the church. The greatest threat comes from within the church in the form of apostasy. Stay tuned as we talk with one of Christendom's foremost authorities about the raging spiritual apostasy that exists in the church today. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Once again this week, for the third week in a row, we have as our special guest a wonderful lady named Carol Matriciana, who is considered to be one of Christendom's foremost experts on Eastern religions, contemporary cults, and Christian apostasy. Carol is a documentary film producer from California. Over the past 30 years, she has produced over 60 videos concerning false religions, cults, and apostasy. Carol, welcome back. Well, thank you. It sounds like you've been awfully busy. That's an average of two a year. Wow. <laughs> and I started so young. <laughs> Oh my. Okay. Well, also here in the studio with me to help me interview Carol is our web minister, Nathan Jones. Nathan is involved in battling apostasy on a daily basis as he talks back and forth via our website with people literally all over the world concerning both Bible prophecy and the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Nathan, how about kicking off our discussion? I'd be delighted to. Thanks, Dave. And I'm delighted to have you Thank back. You. You're a great Thank guest. You. Thank a great you guest. so much, Nathan. Let's start our discussion with talking about the health of evangelism. Evangelical Christianity today. And even the word evangelical, I, I know when I was little and growing up, the word evangelical meant you went to the Bible for your faith, what was truth and all that. But the word evangelical seems to be losing its meaning in this day and age. Would you agree? Absolutely, because we're in what is called a postmodern era, postmodern culture. Now, the postmodern philosophy teaches that there are no absolute truths. So the original evangelical, traditional evangelical thought that the Bible was the inerrant word of God, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But now the postmodern is teaching that truth actually isn't knowable. Now this is an Eastern worldview. You see, in Eastern mysticism, truth is all embracing. Truth is, uh, your truth is good for you, it's, my truth is good for me. And in order for the two of us to unite, we must dialogue and converse. Well, we know what happened in the Bible with the first conversation. The first conversation was with the serpent, mm -hmm. with Eve. She was sinless, without sin, pure, made in the image of God. And he came and tempted her with a desire, which is extraordinary, that she could be kind of more like God. But she was without sin. So what's been happening within Christendom is that we can supposedly become more like God through Eastern mysticism. Satan used Eve's reason, her imagination, the fruit looked like it was good to eat. And so all of these concepts of dialogue and conversation have come in where we're talking with each other's opinions. Well, opinions are nothing, it's God's opinion. If God says that evil is evil and good is good, then that should be our evangelical Bible-believing standard. So we've given up then the Bible as our source of truth and turned to ourselves as the source of truth? Um, as conversation, as dialogue. It's called consensus. consensus. You, 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 um, you bring in the concept of, uh, of a, a crisis situation, you, you dialogue about it and you meet in the middle. So it's a sort of synthesis. You bring in a, an, the idea of, uh, well, let's all get together and try and solve this solution. Well, if you're with a Muslim, or a Hindu and a Christian, and you're all trying to dialogue about sin, there is no meeting place mm. if you're going to stand on biblical truth. So in order for us to bring in what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days, which is a one world religion, we've got to be able to merge all our ideas so that Jesus is no longer the deity that the Bible says Jesus is, and we can become the deity. In other words, we can define our own truths. 
And a Muslim can define his Allah as being the same as, uh, let's say, a Bible, the, what the Bible describes as God, which are not the same. The Muslim's God is the moon God. You see the crescent on top of every mosque because they worship the moon well, of God. I, I want to get back to the emergent church movement, though. Yeah. Um, the emergent church movement seems to me to be one of the most dangerous movements in America today because the leaders of it claim to be evangelical. They have, using that claim, been able to infiltrate evangelical seminaries, evangelical churches. I see them showing up at the most conservative denominations in America, uh, making their presentations, and yet these are people who deny absolute truth. And uh, it, it's just, you know, the Bible has absolute truth. They say it does not. They, they, they deny that. And everything gets into touchy-feely. One of the things that they're doing is uh, getting back to, uh, for example, I know of a major evangelical church where the pastor came in and said, okay, from now on we're going to have card tables in the lobby. On each card table is going to be a Greek icon, and there's going to be instructions about how you can kneel and pray to the icon. Mm -hmm. And well, this is evangelical the, church. Absolutely. That's the idea of ecumenical uh, discussion, conversation with those that perhaps don't believe in your same faith, whether they're those of other religions or that claim to be Christians. How can we bring all Christian denominations together? And a lot of it seems to be getting back to the touchy feely stuff that was characteristic, say, of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. It's the idea of you've got to have incense and you've got to have uh, 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 you know, things of that nature, candles and so forth, that this will all draw you into a deeper relationship with God. It becomes very very uh, uh, mystical. Mystical, that's the word. Yeah, it's, well, it's this new spirituality which is through mysticism. You see, when you don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, there's that vacuum in you and you want to have a mystical experience. We are made to have a relationship. So you have a relationship with the wrong, the lying spirits, doctrines of demons. And how can we know that? You have to know the Bible in order to test the spirits which we're told to do in the scriptures. But if you don't have the living sword, the two-edged sword, yeah. the testing ability, then the experience that I feel is my experience and it feels like a good experience and it is a spiritual experience and I know having come from the new age that it's very powerful, it's very real and it appears to be truthful. And the leader a bumper sticker that says coexist on your <laughs> Yeah, there you go. The, the, the leader, the recognized leader of the emergent church movement uh, recently uh, appeared at a, a very conservative college here in Texas. I wrote the president of that college and I said, hey, this is a guy, I, I I gave him two pages of quotes. Homosexuality, what difference does it make? That's his attitude. Um, absolute truth, no, there's no such thing. Uh, he went on and on. I gave quote after quote after quote. And uh, I said, you're going to have this man speak to your people? This is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He wrote back and he said, well, I don't really know anything about him. The, the chairman of our Bible department arranged this. I'll have him write to you. The chairman of the Bible department wrote to him and said, well, I'm sure you've probably taken all these quotes out of context because I met him and he's such a nice person. Well, there you nice go, guy. you see. He's I've, such I've, a nice I've person. I've met him and he's a nice guy. That's a, a deluding spirit. <laughs> see, we cannot, it's not who we speak to. Uh, it's not an emotional level. The Bible tells us to test the spirit. We have got to test on a spiritual level, not emotional. So what's happening with the new emergent church is it's plugging into emotions, subjectivity, it's a feel-good faith, it's um, the don't, d truth is judgmental, don't be so judgmental. Absolutely, Tolerate. absolutely. Tolerate. The well, that's the, the ethic ecumenical, now, right? that's the idea of embracing all religions. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have the breakdown of all denominations in Christianity in order to bring in the new one world religion. People say to me, well, you, you really must be exaggerating what these people say. Well, at first they were really subtle, but now in recent years I've noticed they have become very open. For example, here's a quote from one of the leaders of the movement. My goal is to destroy Christianity as a world religion and be a recatalyst for the movement of Jesus Christ. A recatalyst for a the movement? A recatalyst. For the movement of Jesus Christ? Yes. What, what is that? What, which Nobody Jesus? knows what that means. That's yeah. mumbo jumbo. Well, the problem <laughs> So remember that Jesus said in Matthew 24, four times He says there's going to be religious deception in the last days. Oh, there's absolutely. going to be false teachers in the last days. False teachings. Beware, they're going to come in the name of Christ. They're going to come in My name, He said. His name is Christianity. Here is a false Jesus Christ. So, the Antichrist, why is He called Antichrist? Like Jesus. Yes. So, we have got to 
recondition the minds of everybody to think that this new Christ consciousness, this new Jesus Christ, is going to be something that we can all embrace, whether you're Muslim, Hindu, whatever it is. And the big peace plan of a leading evangelical movement teacher today is about bringing in global Christianity, global peace plan, global ecumenical ideas. So what you're saying is that this emergent church movement is really just part of many different movements that exist that are de designed to prepare the way for the one world religion of the Absolutely. Antichrist. Absolutely. And they're going, it's, it's the ecumenical idea of going into every denomination, whether it's Episcopalian, Protestant, uh, Reformed theology, whatever it is, it is that we all must come to a census, a consensus of a new Jesus Christ a new Christ consciousness. Welcome back to our interview of Carol Matriciana, one of Christendom's most respected experts on Eastern religions, contemporary cults, and Christian apostasy. We've been talking with her about apostasy in the church today, and we want to focus now on what's called the emergent church movement. Carol, can you define that for us, the emergent church movement? What does that mean? It's a difficult word because <laughs> think about emerging. emerging I mean, yeah. how do you define emerging? It hasn't come yet. We don't know where, what <laughs> where it's, it's going, going to turn into because it's emerging. And it's a very, very, very clever, incredible label for a movement that is actually going to be emerging into the one world, relation, one world religion that is going to usher in the Antichrist. So that's what it's emerging to. It's emerging to new truths. It's emerging into a new Christ. It's emerging into new concepts of that you don't, un you don't need to understand truth. Well, basically, but, aren't they saying that Christianity needs to be reconstructed? Reformed, reinvented, redesigned, because it isn't... Just throw the Bible out then. Well, it sounds good, because in actual fact, they want to try and reach out to the postmodern culture. And they say Very that much. traditional Bible-believing Christians don't do that. Well, it, what it's actually, if you look at the back of that concept, the back of that concept is saying that God didn't know that we were going to be a postmodern generation <laughs> right now, and God didn't anticipate that men were going to become such wretched sinners, and so God gave up because he he didn't <laughs> really. He didn't, and they found well, that out how? Well, <laughs> that's what it. If if you think it through logically, that's oh, what it's it's out of saying their own heads, then. because it's yeah. saying that God didn't design the Bible to to. Um, converse to attract today's generation. Well, no, what's happening is today's generation is so pulling away from truth. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word is what we've got to come back to. We've got to realize that we're sinners. We've got to come back to the center. But another concept we've got to realize is that within Eastern mysticism and Hinduism, it's based on the idea of evolution. See, there are, there are two opposing worldviews. One is that God created, which is creation, and one is that the world evolved. And there is evolving truth. There is evolving um, religianity. There is re re evolving. So that is where the emerging comes in based on the foundation of evolution. It seems to me like that the emergent church movement simply does not understand the power of the Word of God. They feel like that we have to uh, change the gospel, uh, present it in a whole different way uh, in order to uh, relate to the modern generation. But the gospel is supernatural in its power. Just as you were converted just like that, mm -hmm. uh, this can happen to a person in the postmodern generation if they're confronted with their sin. If they're confronted with the Word. And, See, and with the I Word. I got given the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If I hadn't have been given the gospel, I couldn't have got saved. The gospel is that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And that's what was given to me in those few minutes that, made, that opened my eyes. It's the power of the Word that opens the eyes. Now, Satan knows this. Satan came to Eve in, in Genesis 3 and said, surely God hasn't said. He immediately attacked the authority of the Word. And so it hasn't, it's no different. You know, I, I've become more and more convinced that the people involved in the emergent church movement are moving in the direction of the old liberal mainstream Christianity of saying really what it's all about is environmentalism, it's the protection of nature, it's protection of, of Mother Earth, and, and uh, we're going to bring peace to the whole world. And all. Let me read you a statement by the leader, gospel. the leader of the movement. Here's a statement. The church has been preoccupied with the question, what happens to your soul after you die? Uh, 
as if the reason for Jesus coming can be summed up in Jesus is trying to help get more souls into heaven as opposed to hell after they die. I just think a fair reading of the gospel blows that out of the water. I don't think the entire message and life of Jesus can be boiled down to that bottom line of saving souls. How sad, how awful, because Jesus said that He comes that none mm -hmm. should perish. He came to to give us eternal life so that none should perish. And that was the whole purpose. This Jesus same fellow held a conference in Seattle, which your friend Eric Barger, who our viewers know well, attended. And he said, we've interpreted John 3.16 incorrectly. It has nothing to do with salvation of souls. It has to do with salvation of the world. Jesus came to die for the world. And He invited people to come up afterwards and put their hands in dirt and commit themselves to saving the environment. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, within Eastern mysticism, the world is Mother Goddess. The environment is who should be worshipped. It's the matriarchal system, not the patriarchal. If we have to go even further back to Satan, this is demonic, this is satanic, and we have to understand that just as there is a personal God, there is a personal enemy of God, and that is Satan. And his attack has been on the Word of God, the authority of God, the purpose of Jesus, because he said to Eve in the garden, surely you won't die. If you follow me, you won't die. If you follow me, you'll get wisdom. If you follow me, you can be like God. All of these are the fundamentals of the, event, of the emerging church movement. Would you say the movement then isn't a particular denomination? Oh. No. So in it all penetrates of into everywhere. all denominations. Okay. The people that are the leaders of the emerging movement claim that they came from evangelical backgrounds. Now, they may have come from evangelical church backgrounds, but they didn't understand the authority of the Word of God because they have, were raised in a postmodern generation, the idea that truth is relative, truth is not knowable, truth, we need to debate it, we need to get into uh, a sort of... Uh, protagonist uh, situation where we can debate and create, uh, we get a thesis, we get a, the opposite <laughs> of a thesis and we combine it Human with a synthesis and it's all about wisdom. Well that wisdom. reminds me of the fact that the leader of the emergent church movement was invited recently to come to Dallas to speak to one of the most outstanding evangelical seminaries in all the world right here in Dallas, Texas. And the president of the seminary was confronted by people who said, what are you doing? Why are you inviting this person in who's a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, you have to understand, he said, we're an educational institution. We have to be open to all ideas and all people can come in and speak. And they said, well then, if you're going to invite a false per, uh, a, pers a person teaching a false gospel, at least have a faculty member get up and be given equal time to confront him. No, that wouldn't be polite. Right. Polite. Well, you see, I came from, uh, well, how did I get involved in the New Age? Because I was given a plethora <laughs> of beliefs. And because this world is controlled by Satan, Satan is the god of this world, I was under seduction and seducing sure. spirits and doctrines of demons. So, if, if one doesn't understand the reality of Satan's warfare in this, we don't understand the war we're involved in. But, I mean, look, recently we've had America's pastor named by Time magazine who invited three New Age, completely Eastern, indoctrinated, mystical doctors into his health plan to uh, introduce his entire congregation of 22,000 people to a new health and wellness plan. Now, these three doctors between themselves had an Eastern worldview. Even though one is a Muslim, one is a Jew, one is a, a Christian mystic, they come from an Eastern worldview background that within ourselves is a potential that we can heal ourselves. And that is the idea of Eastern mysticism, that within us we can connect to divinity, we can heal ourselves, it's mind over matter, yes. it's hypnosis, self-hypnosis. So this is what the emerging church is all about. New ideas that have come from the East, they're not new ideas, they're old ideas. It's the old life from the Garden of Eden. And look at the, but, look at the society they produced in the East. Look at that society yeah, to see point. that it is not a, a nurturing, in fact it's a very cruel system. One of the words I hear over and over in the emergent church uh, leaders is the word contemplative. They really heavy on that. Let me read you a quote here from one of their leaders. The fact is that contemplative spiritual, spirituality will play a huge part in the church of the future. And I want to assure you that can are just the beginning. 
Why? Because we're changing the names. If they said Eastern mysticism is going to play a huge part in the new church, we wouldn't buy it. But when you say contemplate, that sounds better. And they intercut contemplate with meditate. But in Eastern mysticism, the contemplation and the meditation is in the snake within you, the idea that you can become one with everything. So that contemplative idea, which, by the way, is also deeply rooted in the Desert Fathers, which is part of Roman Catholicism, the mystical idea of connecting through silence, which is opposed to the Bible. We don't connect to God through silence, but mm. that, is the part, that is part of centering prayer, contemplative spirituality, uh, that you go into a silence, you practice the presence. Well, all of these are emotional feelings. They're based on subjectivity. It's based on relative truth. Your experience is as good as my experience. What they don't understand that Satan is called an angel of light and the demon of darkness, that dragon, who is out to deceive the whole world. His job is deception, and he's going to come in as an angel of light. In fact, that same scripture, 2 Corinthians 11, says, no wonder his ministers appear as yeah. ministers of righteousness. Yes. yes, subjectivity always leads to an openness to deception. It's like people who tell me, God told me this or God told me that, and they'll tell me something that's totally off the wall, as if they think that every thought that goes through our fallen minds comes from God. And even if they had a thought from God, it might be completely uh, convoluted by the time it goes through our fallen minds. We need to test everything by the Word of God. We have to. It's, it's a, the, the blindness of it is like taking a sailor out into the middle of the ocean, and he'll just go wherever the boat and the currents take him to. You know, a sailor, it, it, he has to have a compass. He has to have a direction. Even at night, if he doesn't have a compass or direction, he's got the stars. Those are based on objective truth and reality. Right. Right. We have to have our guidebook, the, the, the manual that God has given us to test his character against the character of Satan, his well-being, his mercy, his grace, a personal relationship with him as opposed to our subjective feelings. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion with Carol Matriciana about the emergent church movement. Carol, what are some of the red flags, warning signs that people should watch for that might indicate that their church is suddenly moving in the direction of the emergent church movement? I would say it's the way that the, the church teaches the Word of God. There are two different types of teaching. There's a thematic way of teaching, which is based on topics. Mm -hmm. And if you do that topical teaching, which a lot of emergent churches are doing, then, then they're able to pull in order to bring their topic, to persuade their topic to go along their line of thought. They can maybe pull one or two Bible well, verses. Oh, they can always find there. a verse. <laughs> and they can pull from Gandhi's writings and William Shakespeare's writing and Churchill's writings to support the view. They can also take it as in uh, uh, The Purpose Driven Life, which has taken 15 different Bible versions. Not all of those are even translated. Well, you fish around or you find one that says what you want it to say. Or half a verse that yeah. says what you want it to say. Yeah. So I think that's the danger of thematic teaching, whereas the other type of teaching, which is based on, ex on expository teaching, on line by line, verse by verse, actually based on what does God say about this? What is God's opinion based on the Word of God in the full counsel of God, and you'll find that a lot of churches, if they're not teaching the Word of God in the fullness of the context, I'm sorry to say that they would be open to bringing in authors, books, ideas, Eastern mystical ideas, changing the words so that it can go from meditation to contemplation or from yoga to Christian yoga and all this kind of thing. The sad know? fact of the matter is that the church has ignored the Word for so long, for years now, that the average Christian going to church faithfully every Sunday knows very little of the Word. And you cannot guard yourself against deception if you do not know the Word. I, I remember the impact of that book, The Shack, and uh, it's about as uh, unchristian as it could be in what it's teaching, and yet people thought it was wonderful and preachers were advocating people go out and read it. Well, look at Harry Potter. When I made my documentary on Harry Potter, I had more Christians come to me saying, what are you doing with our hero? Harry, <laughs> with our hero. <laughs> He's a witch. 
witch. It's a 13-year-old <laughs> witch. That, that The author of Harry Potter said that it would take seven years to make a wizard. And Harry is 11 in one book, 12 in the next, 30, etc. Seven years later, the perfect wizard is made. And the hundreds and thousands of children reading mm -hmm. those books are then indoctrinated with another worldview. Well, speaking of your video on that, I know that you have uh, produced a great number of videos on fascinating topics like Harry Potter and yoga and the emergent church movement. How about telling our viewers how to get in touch with, uh, with you and your website? Well, thank you. They just need to go on to www.caryl, I spell my name in a different way, C-A-R-Y-L, TV.com. Seven letters. C-A-R-Y-L-T-V. <laughs> Seven com. letters dot com. Thank okay. you. Okay. Carol, do you have any final words you'd like to say to someone out there who is struggling right now with trying to figure out whether, you know, find trying to find a church? What, what should they look for in trying to find a church? Oh, I get so many letters from people saying that our church is going emergent. We've read this. We've read that. Well, you know, don't be discouraged because we're told in the last days this is what's going to happen. There is going to be a falling away from truth. Great that you've discerned it. There's also another thing that says in the last days they will come from within us. So we know that the teachers and the false prophets are coming from the church. That's good that they're recognizing that. I would suggest um, meeting, starting up, being with a group of people that teach line on line, verse by verse, yeah. teaching of the Bible. Get back to the Word of God. Christ. And encouraging us to be strong in the Word so go. that we can go out and give the message and make disciples of all nations. Well, Carol, you've been a great blessing to us. Thanks again for being with us. Folks, that's our program for this week. Want to know more about the dangerous heresy of the emergent church movement? Order Carol Matriciana's comprehensive eye-opening DVD, Wide is the Gate, by going to caroltv.com.